at UM Health. This episode is called Medical Physics from Curie to Cure, a Synergistic Effect, where we aim to shine a spotlight on the medical physicists in our faculty. Now, people from radiology or radiation oncology are very familiar with uh, the medical physicists. There's nothing that we do that doesn't involve them. Every image we acquire, every therapy that we deliver uh, wouldn't be possible without them. The modern medical physicist, however, extends far beyond um, the realms of radiology and radiation oncology and extend into, um, into medicine and surgery, certainly, but into architecture, computing, engineering, and, and all sorts. So we aim to highlight and showcase the role of the modern medical physicist today. Today we have with us uh, Prof. Ng Kwan Hung, Associate Professor Jeannie Wong, and Associate Professor Ng, who are all medical physicists. Um, we begin with Prof. Ng Kwan Hung. So Prof. Ng Kwan Hung um, received the very prestigious Mary Skorgoska Curie Award from the IOMP in 2018. Prof. Ng, maybe we can begin with you um, telling us a little bit about what, what, what exactly is a medical physicist. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Raja Riza, for the kind introduction. So I'll uh, begin by telling you who we are, what do we do, and a bit about history and, and things in general. Okay? So as uh, the title is Medical Physics from Curie to Cure a Synergistic Effect. So we hope by the end of the talk, we come across to you that with this working together, the collaboration, the interdisciplinary brings about a synergistic effect for the improvement of healthcare and uh, patient safety. Now, the, from Curie to Cure, we all know the famous so-called the Madame Marie Stokowska Curie, the famous scientist or the physicist, uh, and being a woman at the time, she faced a lot of challenges. And some of these challenges are still being encountered today. And she won the Nobel Prize in physics, but also she have twice in a lifetime to won the Nobel Prize. And during the First World War, uh, she developed as a uh, driver, the ambulance, the nurse, and set up the primitive x-ray set to x-ray the wounded, the injured uh, soldiers and civilians. So that uh, also is credit to discover radium and also one of the pioneers in radioactivity, which today uh, in say nuclear medicine, we use a lot of radioisotopes and so many of the early uh, studies were all done by her and uh, the other colleagues, her husband, her daughters, do all these uh, Nobel laureates. So I can say that she was the, the beginning of the modern uh, medical physics with Madame Curie uh, until today. Now, in Malaysia, we have a relatively short <coughs> uh, history of medical physics being developed. By 1955, the Kuala Lumpur General Hospital started the Department of Radiotherapy, Oncology, and Nuclear Medicine. And they started with uh, a very small unit, so called superficial x ray machine, dealing 50 kilowatt only. And then uh, the very first uh, clinical medical physicist completed his training in 1960. So we have about 60 years of very short history compared to other medical specialties and of course the, the science and they have been hundreds of years. So that was a beginning and today we have about 35 centers delivering the oncological services of, and hundreds of centers with radiological imaging and others. And of course, all this while we expanded and we had some about 350 medical physicists throughout the country. Now that medical physics used in a very broad sense of the word and we have uh, quite a number who work in the regulatory bodies with the Ministry of Health, with the national, the state and various government agencies. So 
very strong uh, regulatory system. Obviously, the use of uh, radiation benefits patients' diagnosis therapy, but at the same time, it is this uh, concomitant uh, hazard. So we need uh, the regulatory people in force. Uh, yes, about 0.01 uh, physicists per uh, thousand population. This is still quite low compared to countries like that in the Australia, uh, Europe, and uh, America. And those of the physicists engaged uh, in the clinical service, the majority are in the radiotherapy, and that is still the, the main uh, core competency of the medical physicists. And the uh, imaging uh, is still coming up, and those some are involved in research, teaching in the industry as well. So uh, medical physics actually deals with the use of physics and engineering principles the, <clears throat> in methods as well in the practice and research. So they're involved in the prevention, the diagnosis, uh, also the treatment, of course it cover monitoring, management as well of diseases. So the main subfields will be in radiation oncology or radiotherapy and medical imaging, or some call it radio diagnosis uh, in nuclear medicine. And I talk about the uh, safety of patient, there will be health physics or radiation protection. We also are involved in non ionizing radiation, uh, such as in laser, uh, one example, or microwave radio frequency, and uh, healthcare informatics. And many of the nature of the physics training, they are computer literate. Uh, very strong in maths and stats as well. So they were involved uh, quite a lot in the IT, in the informatics development, moving to the AI. Uh, in uh, some countries, they are involved in physiological measurement, uh, measuring the signals like EEG, ECG, and others as well. So you can see the medical physics is very wide uh, scope that we cover. So briefly run through later, my colleagues here will explain more about that. So we know about the oncology, uh, the use of uh, radiation for treatment and radiotherapy. Uh, latest thing is the proton therapy we heard. So involved in treatment planning, in quality control to ensure the safe and precise delivery of radiation to the target, that is the tumor. And uh, also in terms of uh, various daily uh, quality assurance activities uh, as well. And then in medical imaging, it's in radiology, both diagnostic and intervention. And we all know that the, the modern healthcare is image centric, right? uh, with CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, and the traditional or conventional uh, general x ray. So we are all involved in the quality assurance uh, of all these uh, imaging aspects to ensure our radiology colleagues just like Prof. Uh, Raja Riza here, a radiologist, will have the, the best image for making an accurate diagnosis. And this is how we work together with radiologists in that way. Also ensure that uh, the dose to the patients are kept to the minimum. And then the other subfield is nuclear medicine. We know about PET. It is still very hot. The PET city came to, and it's so useful. Uh, in uh, helping the clinicians uh, to assure them uh, of the prognosis of the, the cancer, whether they spread or whether the tumor is still uh, the metabolic status of that as well. So they have the PET uh, the, and also the gamma camera is traditional workhorse and uh, many uh, radioisotopes is for so-called targeted therapy as well. So uh, I mentioned earlier the regulatory the is compliance is, is important because the use of radiation in the world, they have been licensed, so you need regulation, uh, you need inspection, audit as well. So we have this uh, in Malaysia is under the Atomic Energy Licensing Act, the Act 304. So this is regulated by the Atomic Energy Licensing Board uh, in healthcare is delegated to the Ministry of Health, the Director General. 
the non-ionizing laser micro RF, uh, this also uh, part of the competency of the medical physicist. Of in the research, we have been involved a lot in artificial intelligence, in image processing, uh, and analysis, and we keep on expanding that, uh, collaborating with our colleagues. And now come to our UM Health. <laughs> We had uh, started the uh, medical physics unit. It is a service unit at the University of Medical, medical Center. So I was the, the first uh, head, uh, probably that's about 15 years ago, we set up. Uh, and now it's uh, under the capable hands of one Asling. She's uh, in charge of the, the unit. So we provide the clinical service uh, to the whole uh, UM Health and also they are involved in make sure that uh, we comply with the regulations and so on. So they are also involved with teaching and research and uh, others as well, or the day-to-day -day running. And we also have an academic medical physicist. Uh, so uh, today we have uh, Prof. Jenny Wong and Dr. Vincent Ung uh, with us this morning. And we have uh, Dr. Tan Diko, Dr. Aslan Homa, and uh, Mr. Sharun. So we have a uh, different interests and different uh, specialties and uh, expertise, uh, different aspects of medical physics. So involved in teaching, uh, research, and to some extent, uh, clinical service as well. And we run the, the Master of Medical Physics. Uh, it's a coursework. Uh, this is worthy of saying a bit more it, it is the first and still the only one that has been accredited by the uh, ipm there's a uk body the institute of physics and engineering in medicine uh, outside the uk and ireland so we are the only uh, such program being accredited being recognized so that set us a very high benchmark a high standard for us and uh, we ensure that uh, the training in terms of the education is of the, the world class. And that attracted lo lots of uh, international students as well. Because the program is Malaysian based, so the bar is still Malaysian. But we have uh, um, students from Brunei, Cambodia, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Jordan, Kenya, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore. Uh, Sudan, uh, Vietnam. So we encourage uh, international students to join us. And also we are recognized uh, in the Regional Educational Center by the IAEA. Uh, so after the, the master program uh, in different countries, they need the clinical uh, training. It's just like uh, the MO ship of the medical specialties. They spend uh, two years at least the clinical, they need to choose a subspecialty, be it oncology, uh, nuclear medicine, or in radiology. So IA does provide the fellowship, and some of them come to our center. Uh, with the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, is an UN organization. So these are some of our past fellows uh, from different countries, and they return to their own countries to continue uh, to, to start, to provide clinical service, but also uh, training the junior ones as well. So we are taking a leading role in education and training in, in the region. Uh, finally, I would like to say that what we are as a medical physicist is a, is a clinical profession as well as also is a science discipline. It's unique. It is very young uh, in this country. Our master program just started about 20 odd years, uh, still being developed. Too. But we see ourselves as we are the, the bridge. So we bridge the basic principles, knowledge of physics with the medicine. Uh, as Prof. Riza mentioned, it goes beyond radiology, oncology, goes beyond, you go to cardiology, surgery, and others. So we keep on building uh, bridges and ultimately. It will be for the benefit of a patient and the benefit of how uh, the medical field as a whole will keep on progressing and keep on improving the quality of life. Yeah. 
So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, um, thank you for the introduction to what a med medical physicist does. Now, uh, I know that you spent your life work researching breast imaging, Prof. Is that right? Yeah. And cancer is this huge challenge um, to all disciplines, and medical physicists um, are not spared that challenge. And I think you've also uh, contributed a, a lot to to research and development of breast imaging, not only in University of Malaya. But also regionally and internationally, could could you share with us some some of your work um, that you've done regarding breast imaging and cancer research, Prof? Yeah, I uh, choose breast cancer as an example. Uh, it is also my core research interest uh, from diagnosis, and then my colleagues will talk about the different aspects of therapy management and to prediction. Uh, as you, I try to point out the fact that it's not a single discipline, not an individual. Right? As cancer is extremely multi and interdisciplinary, and there's still a lot of things uh, we don't know about it. Now, I have the advantage uh, also, uh, I did my PhD in the Department of Pathology, very unusual. Uh, Situation. Anyway, I learned a lot, and I appreciate uh, coming uh, and my supervisors, Prof. Louis, uh, the famous pathologist. And I appreciate a lot how uh, the pathology to understand uh, the etiology of rare diseases and particularly cancer. Uh, this is an interesting slide. So you know why? Like we keep on developing, inventing new diagnostic imaging. I believe memo graphy or CT or MRI. So we want to visualize as small as possible, preclinical, and this is where it is non-invasive and which has a very high chance of cure. So our focus is on the early detection of breast cancer. And there's a lot of motivation towards that. The early diagnose, a higher cure and a better treatment and much better outcome. So mammogram is considered today, right? It is still the, the gold standard uh, in imaging. Uh, it is very study has shown that it is reduced mortality by up to 30% with women from 50 to 69 years of age and up to 18% those younger women 40 to 50 years. And it's still a matter of choice uh, for those uh, the practice of uh, diagnosing breast cancers into symptomatic women. Of course, we also, along with uh, mammography, use ultrasound, or MRI uh, as well. And, but mammography, it is still an imperfect technique. And there's, today, there's so much uh, research initiative spent in that. See the sensitivity it is pretty low, about 40% in dense breasts. Now those dense breasts, are, there are a lot of young women with brain stress is a pretty large percentage of fibroglandular tissue. And that has always been a diagnostic uh, dilemma and radiologists and breast surgeons uh, were to use the ultrasound or even MRI to help them in uh, confirmation of the diagnosis. And this is something called the masking effect, where the breast cancer normally found in the bright fibroglandular tissue and which is dense, meaning the breast is full of larger proportion of the uh, fibroglandular tissue. And this has been masked, this is hidden. Uh, look for those tumors to be a challenging task. And this issue has been, has driven me uh, in go into this area uh, for the last uh, almost 30 years of my uh, career. So those who have a, a dense breast, so the risk of the wing cancer will be twice higher right, uh, than those are the normal breast. So when a woman presents with a higher density in breast is more granular tissue, then the risk is higher. 
uh, various statistics, some twice, some could be three, uh, different studies have uh, different uh, indications uh, report on that. So this give you an example uh, in a mammogram. So you see that uh, the dense plus the whitish part the, will be the the ducts, uh, the lobules, and uh, the fibro part of the. This is the so-called the dense part, and the rest is adipose tissue, uh, the non-dense part. So. Uh, a lot of my work has been doing this called volumetric breast density. The breast is a three-dimensional organ, so we need to look at the volume. Because mammogram is just a two-dimension only, so looking at the volume, the actual volume, uh, the weight of it. So it is the volume of those fibroglandular tissue over the, the volume of the, the whole breast. Right? So there is uh, still a lot of work uh, to develop on this. So, now, if you know this breast density, in particular volumetric breast density, it is correlated with uh, the risk of missing a cancer. Remember, I mentioned this masking effect, and also the risk of developing a cancer. So, we can estimate the risk, we can predict whether this breast density of certain percentage, what is the probability it will develop a breast cancer. Of course, along with the patient history uh, and many other uh, factors as well. And this is something in physics called X-ray attenuation to, to review the different gray uh, levels on the mammogram. An example, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues still. Uh, typically, radiologists will just use visual, just look, oh, based on the experience, this is how many percent of breast, and we have this by red density system data coded. Right? Uh, and we have been using, well, PARA is one of the, the major uh, breast density tool. It's a computer uh, software, pretty advanced. I work on it, and my grad students a lot on that, and comparing with that uh, with the visual classification by the radiologist. And we also refer to MR. Uh, which actually is very accurate, determine the, the fatty or the granular part of the breast. So you can see there's some discrepancy. Uh, there's quite a large discrepancy between the visual and uh, software and MR. So there's a motivation for more research to work out a much more accurate, uh, reliable uh, breast density tool and the software tool as well. The good news why we spend so much uh, initiative, still a, a lot of international research, is the density uh, is a modifiable risk factor. It is influenced by our lifestyle uh, as well, whether we are sedentary or we are <coughs> for regular exercise. Right? Or food consumption has been study indicate whether uh, yeah, meat person or vegetable diet or vitamin D, calcium, various aspects somehow will modify the breast density. Right? And there's good news. Uh, we can, let's say, one with high density upon diagnosis and uh, lifestyle or food and others, you can change that right? from a higher to a lower, thus reducing the risk. And I've been working uh, with the pathologists as well as uh, the breast surgeons, uh, Prof. Dr. Yip Chengha and um, Prof. Aisha. So this is our uh, most celebrated paper in Lancet Oncology <laughs> quite a while ago, 2012, uh, the standardization of clinical breast density and measurements. You appreciate and one of the work in physics, we do measurement, we standardize like this, what physics is all about. And that's important so that, let's say, you've done your mammogram in Hospital A and Hospital B later for follow-up, or might be another country in Singapore. So we want all them to be standardized so that we can compare them. Uh, we can chart the progress, on a much more robust prediction. So that's why we want to define that uh, density properly, all researchers, all doctors will agree 
a pond. Uh, we are almost there, right? And this is also uh, international uh, protocols for assessing breast density so that we can compare meaningfully, uh, we can accurately predict uh, and prevent that. And just show the uh, very interesting, right? The, the, the focus is on patient, right? We want to improve patient care. So I mentioned pathologists, breast surgeon. We will work with uh, computer scientists, epidemiologists as well. Uh, and many uh, uh, nurses, uh, radiographers are very important as well. Uh, oncologists, uh, I mentioned surgeons, and, and many others. So it is very multi and inter this approach. Remember, talk about the bridges. So we try to form more and more uh, bridges in that. There's still a lot of work. To so I just want to acknowledge these are my uh, various uh, collaborators in this aspect, uh, from radiologists to uh, surgeon and uh, pathologists, and also uh, computer scientists. Yeah, from Monash and my grad uh, PhD students before. These are the international collaborators, in particular, uh, Dr. Rajendra from Singapore, which is team. We work a lot on the radiomics and AI. Uh, Prof Wong will elaborate more about that later. Uh, and also my international from uh, Brazil and, and Vietnam as well. And, and recently, I uh, worked with uh, Prof C, uh, breast surgeon, so Dr. Wong from MMU. So we're looking at uh, Prof.C is doing this breast reconstruction. So we use this technique called photogrammetry method, taking uh, different camera, different views, and to reconstruct so that uh, the reconstruction will be uh, as close as uh, possible uh, to the, the original uh, status. So we also are using the machine learning to improving this. So that will be uh, currently we are working on that so there are a lot of scope to collaborate uh, with different uh, specialties and just want to and this is like uh, a saying that i always share in my talk is because breast density can be altered right can be modified breast destiny can be altered too right so that is a lot of hope of uh, early diagnosis coupled with the density you can re predict uh, the risk of breast cancer development but also can modify and improve the outcome yeah thank you uh, prof. great thank you thank you for sharing your life work with us prof prof Ng. So you've given us a very broad overview about this is decades worth of work on, on breast cancer and breast density. We're going to switch gears to something more present now. So Prof. Ong Yi Min uh, works in the Department of Radiation Oncology. I'm going to get Prof. Ong to just describe to us the day-to-day -day roles of what a medical physicist does to deliver care to breast cancer patients. Prof. Ong. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raja. A very good morning to all. So uh, this session, I'll be talking about the role of medical physicists in radiation therapy. So as Prof. mentioned just now, uh, radiation therapy is one of the main disciplines that uh, medical physicists are very much involved in. Now, radi radiation therapy is basically a pro process involves the use of ionizing radiation as part of cancer treatment to control or to kill malignant cells. Now, they are usually being delivered in conjunction with other modalities of cancer treatment, for example, surgery, chemotherapy, as well as hormonal therapy. And radiation therapy has been proven to be beneficial in the treatment of cancers. And really it is physics, engineering, imaging, and technology based. So that's where medical physicists come in in the process of radiation therapy. Now, for those who are not that familiar with our department, the Department of Clinical Oncology, we are located at uh, Manara Timor, level one. And shown in these slides are some of the facilities that we have. We have the what we call as the simulators. We have conventional simulator variant equity, the CT simulator Philips Brilliance. We have a number of treatment planning systems used to plan how radiation therapy should be delivered. 
Now we have Race Station Monaco Eclipse iPlan and HDR Plus, diverse models of TPS here. And in terms of uh, treatment modality themselves, we have uh, three of them. Two medical linear accelerators here, uh, Electa Versa, Versa HD, as well as Variant Novalis. And we also have BBIT multi-source uh, brachytherapy system to deliver what we call as internal uh, radiation or brachytherapy. Now, I would have to say that radiation oncology uh, comprises of uh, various categories of staffs as listed in this slide. Of course, we have the clinical or radiation oncologist, we have medical physicist, therapeutic radiographer or radiation therapist, we have more room technician to uh, fabricate all the different molds or uh, accessories required uh, to be used during treatment, and we have oncology nurses involved as well. Now, to understand the role of uh, medical physicists in radiation oncology departments, we first have to know what are the processes involved in uh, radiation therapy. So, it, uh, of course, it start, starts with diagnosis, staging and consultation, followed by simulation process. So, this is a process where the patient positions during radiotherapy is being decided. Images will be acquired. So, all these images will then be sent for treatment planning at uh, where the physicists will design the treatment to optimize the dose distribution in order to deliver safe and accurate treatment, uh, radiation treatment to the patient. And after the treatment planning process, uh, it will then follow up by treatment delivery. So treatment delivery is primarily performed by the radiation therapist, but there are some roles of medical physicists in, in, in treatment delivery as well. So after delivery, of course, uh, there will be response assessments of the effectiveness of the treatment by our oncologists. Now, out of these processes, the simulation, treatment planning, and treatment delivery, the three main processes here involves medical physicists. Now, all these processes are performed to achieve one aim, which is to, uh, to deliver the prescribed dose to the target and at the same time, we want to spare the surrounding critical structures as well. Now, just a little bit more detail on the processes uh, where medical physicists are involved. First up, we have a simulation. It is a process where we uh, decide the immobilization uh, devices for a patient to ensure the reproducibility of a treatment uh, for the entire uh, fractionated treatment. Uh, we uh, determine the localization of the patient as well, and also to model the patients based on the images acquired during the simulation process. Now, the main role of physicists in this process is to, to quality assure the CT scanner involved uh, in the simulation process. We have to create what we call as the Hounsford unit versus electron density table, which is really important to, uh, for those radiation dose calculation later. And we also assess the effectiveness of the immobilization device used during the simulation process. Now, after simulation, we have the planning process. It's a very important process where the uh, target of tumor will be first defined by the clinicians as well as the critical structures. So sometimes physicists are involved in the delineation of critical structures as well. This is also a process where the radiation dose is being prescribed as well as the dose limits to the surrounding critical structures are being determined. We establish the field portals and finally calculate the dose. Now, in this process, physicists are involved in um, modeling the machine in the treatment planning system to choose the best dose algorithm used for dose calculation. We also do image registration, especially when there are multi-modalities imaging uh, images are involved, for example, MRI, PET images, and of course, we have CT scans as well. And we do beam optimization, as I've mentioned just now, we want to uh, target the tumors uh, to deliver the entire prescribed dose to the tumor safely. And at the same time, we want to minimize the dose to the surrounding normal organs. Then we have to check the feasibility of treatment. So after this process has been performed, we'll get the oncologist to sit down together with us to go through the plan. And if it is deemed to be okay, the oncologist will, be, will approve the plan and the plan will be sent uh, electronically for treatment. So as I mentioned just now, uh, in the treatment process, the main role 
uh, of delivering the treatment will primarily falls on the radiation therapies. So this is a process where the patient will, will be set up on the couch, will be localized, and finally will the radiation will be delivered, uh, uh, of course, safely, in safe manner. So in this process, the physicist will be ensured to ensure, sorry, to ensure the machine is working properly and to we actually calibrate the output of the machine just to make sure that the output is is correct, is accurate, and is uh, in, intended to be delivered to the tumor. We check the fidelity of the treatment process. We are also very much involved in the implementation of new technologies and to ensure the efficiency of the workflow in the entire treatment process. As shown here are some of the uh, tools that we've been using to check the output or the the absolute dose delivered uh, by the machine. Now, as mentioned, all these five processes, these all five processes are involved in radiation therapy. Now, although radiation therapy processes have evolved uh, from like 20, 30 years ago, there are some issues or some rooms for improvement. Now, as an academic department or in a teaching hospital, this opened up an uh, opportunity for us to carry out some uh, research and to perform some uh, improvements, uh, procedures to advance the RT techniques that have been uh, carried out, uh, particularly in our department. So for the next rest of my presentation, I'll be talking about the work they have been working on and some of the research focusing on uh, breast treatment. Now, in these slides, we have uh, two treatment plans. Now, conventionally, breast radiotherapy have been delivered using what we call as the 3D conformal radiotherapy technique or 3D CRT. And recently, we have uh, moved move forward to use a more advanced technique known as the intensity modulated radiotherapy or IMRT. Now, by using this technique, we are able to confirm the radiation dose uh, more tightly to the uh, treated area and at the same time we are able to minimize the radiation dose to the critical structures. For example, in this case we are able to minimize the dose to the lung. So we can see here there are some spillage of dose to the lung here and we can't see any dose to the lung with IMRT. Now in terms of research for breast cancer, we, we are very much focusing on dose verification during red therapy. So Dose verification, we call it as in vivo dosimetry. So these are uh, usually be done on the treated area as well as the other adjacent organs at risk. Now we've been working very closely to this group from the University of Wollongong. So they have actually developed a, a novel type of MOSFET-based radiation detector. And we have been collaborating with them. We, we use it for uh, in vivo dosimetry, measuring dose at the treated breast as well as the control lateral breast. So just to make sure, or just to measure uh, how much the uh, doses is being absorbed by these structures and probably correlate it with the uh, clinical assessment or toxicity after the treatment. Now, I'm very proud to present this intraoperative of breast IORT. So this is uh, another new form of uh, treatment for breast cancer. In fact, uh, UMMC is the uh, first uh, hospital that actually adopt this uh, technology for breast cancer treatment. So basically, LRT is a radiotherapy delivered after the excision of tumor. Uh, uh, currently, it's being used for the treatment of early stage breast cancer, at which we deliver low energy 50 kV X-rays to the lumpectomy cavity uh, at the time of operation. So this procedure is performed during the surgical procedure itself. So in UMMC, we're using the intra-beam system by Kazais. Now this slide basically shows us a very brief uh, flow of what, what is involved during breast IORT. First, the surgeon will uh, excise the tumor, uh, leaving the lumpectomy cavity here. And the spatial type of applicator, we call it breast applicator here. It comes with various uh, sizes. So this applicator will be insert, inserted into the lumpectomy cavity and then uh, radiation will be applied directly to the tumor bed 
it takes about 20 to 30 minutes depending on the size of the uh, cavity and after that uh, the surgical wound will be uh, uh, closed by the surgeons so the benefit of this uh, treatment is that it uh, it minimizes the chance of geographical miss because it actually uh, so the applicator was placed directly on the tumor bed during the surgical procedure and actually minimized the uh, visit to the radiotherapy department because for it, if we are treating a patient with uh, radiotherapy boost using external beam radiotherapy, it, we need a, uh, about six to eight fractions. And for if we are opting for this treatment, we only need uh, one uh, radiation delivery during the surgical process itself. Now, some pictures. So see, this is the pictures taken during an in-house training uh, when the machine was still uh, when the machine was still was installed, and we have the chance to uh, undergo training in Target Academy in per uh, in Royal Free Hospital in London. So, a group of us consisting of surgeons, oncologists, and and of course physicists, we actually went there to undergo some. Uh, training and sharing with uh, the, the team there. So we have Prof Aisha, Prof Maniza, different Dr. C, Dr. Rosita together with the team. And even for IORT procedure, we perform skin dosimetry as well using a type of uh, novel detector. So we measure the skin surrounding the, uh, the surgical procedures during an irradiated site because skin is one of the uh, organs at risk during IRT procedure. So this project is undertaken in collaboration with breast surgeons and oncologists. Now, due to the time constraint, I'll just skip this. Uh, I just want to emphasize that radiation oncology requires teamwork. So it really depends on the cooperation of different categories of staff. We have oncologists, clinicians, and of course, of course, we have medical physicists, radiation therapists, and technicians and nurses. So all of us work towards one aim, that is to deliver highly accurate, uh, safe uh, radiation therapy to our patients. Now, this is my last slide. I'm, I have to say that I'm pretty lucky to have been working with a very enthousi enthusiastic team of uh, academic staff under the de Department of Clinical Oncology. Uh, we, we are comprises of uh, seven oncologists and I am I'm the uh, single uh, academic physicist in this department. But of course, we have some other clinical physicists involved and not forgetting the radiation therapies, nurses as well. So that's all I have. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ong. I really like that last picture. It's really nice. Thank you. So Prof Ung has kindly showed us the practicalities of delivering breast cancer therapy uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to, to patients. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and look to the future. So the most exciting thing worrying most radiologists today is the research on artificial intelligence and radiomics. It promises really quite exciting advances for cancer therapy and diagnosis, but also potentially threatens to put radiologists out of a job so we're lucky that we have Prof. Ginny Wong here, who has been very active in AI and radiomic research. So I'm going to get her to just share a little bit of her work as our last speaker. Prof. G. Thank you, Dr. Rizal. And uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So yeah, medical physics and AI and radiomics, this is a fairly new field. And AI and radiomics are actually not uh, the conventional, as Prof. Hun has met, uh, highlighted. The con conventional field of medical physics is actually in like radiotherapy, nuclear medicine, and radiology, imaging, and all that. So, but AI in the last two decades has been, you know, been very strong, and a lot of research has gone into technology advances has actually enabled a lot of um, what we see AI capability now. So I'm just going to talk a little bit on what we have um, for the medical physics group here. We have also embarked on a bit of uh, our the AI uh, research and radiomic studies here. So uh, to start off, I'd just like to mention that uh, perhaps uh, you may be familiar with a lot of this omic science, the genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And I think our faculty has also a very um, 
established groups that looks into various uh, omic sciences studies here. So basically, omic science is a science that looks into a large amount of quantitative data related to a particular field. And radiomics and radiogenomics are kind of new kids on, new kids on the block. So uh, what are they? Okay, radiomics, uh, if we put it in the term, they, they are the high throughput abstraction of large amount of image features or phenotypes from the radiographic or medical images. We can also combine with other omics to discover relationship. Yeah. So what is the reasoning behind radiomics? In radiology, we have a lot of imaging. You know, we have database with you know a lot of uh, MRI images, CT images, X-ray images, uh, MEMO images. Yeah, um, the multi-parametric morphologic and functional information are playing an increasingly important role in precision medicine. And the hypothesis is that the genetic or molecular changes will manifest in anatomy, in physiology morphological changes and that can be visible through medical images and we call that the imaging phenotypes therefore um, by analyzing the images the imaging phenotypes we may lead to better understanding of the genetic and molecular alteration and therefore providing a customized treatment to patient as we know one medicine is not one size fit all we have already come to accept that reality but what are the efforts toward achieving personalized medicine okay so imaging contains the image the radiological image that we take contains huge amount of image information and they're not just image they're information they're data and they are still largely um, unexplored 90 percent of the medical image are unused uh, we don't fully utilize them i mean okay so However, trying to derive meaningful details from this radiological data is quite challenging and raises the big data issues. So um, in general, this is the radiomic workflow. So we have um, <clears throat> the imaging, um, the whether it's a, be it a CT, MRI, MEMO, yeah? and then we need to segment the uh, images. Generally, we need to segment that the images, so like where's the tumor, you know, or where's the... And this requires <clears throat> the expertise of, for example, my colleague here, radiologist expertise, um, and the clinicians as well. So from there, we will then extract, uh, using computer, you know, uh, high computer power to extract features, we call it the radiomic features, and then later analyze and model uh, radiomic models that can use to you know, predict uh, outcomes. There are generally two approaches to do this. Um, that's the first is the conventional handcraft radiomics and the other is deep learning based. So the conventional handcraft radiomics generally follows this flow here where you have the uh, images and then you segment it, segment it, and you define where the tumor is, and then from there you have the feature selection, uh, the radiomics uh, extraction and selection, and then you use it for uh, the application, which is like diagnosis, classification, prognosis, or genomic uh, relationship. Deep learning, on the other hand, is sort of an uh, end-to-end uh, uh, approach. So they usually import, input the image and pass it through uh, deep learning uh, architecture and then use it for application. So these are two different techniques and um, they use. And in general, there is quite a divide in the field where you know people who, who love deep, deep learning doesn't believe in the hang, uh, uh, conventional handcraft method um, and there is a continuous debate on that uh, which is better now in faculty of medicine as well as in um we have our own um, um, radiomics team and um, called the briomics short for breast radiomics team and it comprises of a large team from radiologists we have uh, prof katini prof anusha prof nolisa prof uh, Dr. Ng Wee Ling, Dr. Chan, Dr. Caroline, Dr. Fahana, and uh, Dr. Prof. Nazri, 
and we work with the surgeon, Prof. Aisha, Prof. C, with the pathologist, Prof. Tio, and ourselves, medical physicist, uh, Dr. Prof. Ng and Dr. Tan Li Kuo from my department, and computer science specialist from the FSKT and the computer science faculty, uh, Prof. Dr. Chang and uh, his students as well. So really, um, it is a very diverse team and we, and again, we are emphasis that uh, we need to collaborate to, to, to do this kind of work. Um, and I have to also mention some of the um, earlier works and um, international collaboration that I think Prof. has already highlighted as well. Um, the, with the, uh, so they have in 2019, they're already looking at uh, computer aided diagnosis, comparison of early detection of breast cancer, uh, as well as breast lesion classification using share wave ultrasound. So they are already some of the early works uh, that the Prof. Ern has embarked with uh, collaboration with his collaborator. So finally, I will finally I would like to end with this slide to um, emphasize that you know we need to collaborate and innovate to ensure patient safety. We cannot work in silos and we need to, you know, build bridges, you know, cross the bridges, not just build the bridges, we need to cross the bridges and start to communicate and talk to different, uh, our clinician colleagues here. And we really like the, our, uh, the clinicians colleague to actually come to talk to us, you know, so that we can, we can know how we can actually help in the patient care, improving patient safety and patient care. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thank you, Prof. Jeannie. That's wonderful. Uh, very brief and very quick ride through the world of, of AI. We're going to take some questions now from the audience, okay? So the first question I think is best answered by Prof. Jeannie, probably because it's related to qualifications to be a medical physicist. Yu Quen Chan asks, what is the basic secondary school level qualification needed for starting on a training career to become a trained medical physicist? Sorry, did you mean secondary school? I mean, it just says uh, what kind of secondary school qualification? I think SPM, obviously, but uh, what's the pathway really to become a medical physicist? I think that's the question. Um, well, this is about education and qualification of medical physicists. So in Malaysia, in Malaysia currently, um, to work as a medical physicist in the hospital, JPA only requires a BSc degree in physics. Um, that is in the current situation. Um, in future, we are, but in international standards worldwide, the qualification to work as a, a medical physicist is actually a master MSc level of medical physics. Yeah, so Malaysia, we have yet, uh, we, we're still currently working towards a, a unified quali a qualification framework. Uh, and we wanted to harmonize we, uh, in the whole country and wanted to match as well with the international standards as well. But just to answer that question, at the moment, it is still a Bachelor of uh, Science. So. Okay. The second question is probably best answered by Prof. Ong. It's a question about IORT. Will breast IORT impede healing of the surrounding tissue? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I believe that question is best answered by the surgeon. But uh, yes, because uh, the process of procedures involves a delivered or high amount of radiation, which is we are talking about 20 gray, it does give some side effects. But from our uh, knowledge, from our experience, most of the side effects are manageable. They are not serious. Uh, they can be manageable and healed in a, within a few months' time. Okay, great. The, the third question is from Shams Ame, our friendly local hand surgeon. And so Jeannie, so Shams is asking, is there a role for AI in sonography of the limbs? Have you read any papers that's dealt with that? Um, I, to be completely honest, I'm, I haven't read any papers on limbs and peripheral nerves. Um, however, certainly there are roles in, uh, of AI in ultrasonography. Um, just taking and some of the examples that I remember, I think uh, Professor 
uh, and he has uh, collaborated with the Singapore uh, researcher in looking at AI in using ultrasound images for kidneys, for breast. We've shown that just now, uh, breast uh, detection, uh, breast cancer detection. And recently, we also have published a um, research on uh, deep learning based uh, segmentation of uh, breast cancer lesion of um, using ultrasound images. Yes, certainly there is a lot of role uh, of AI in ultrasonography. And I believe that we can certainly explore the uh, possibilities in this as well. I hope that answered the questions. Great, thank you, Prof. Jeannie. Uh, there are no other questions on, on this thing. So I think I'll bring the, the session to a close now. We're three minutes short of, of nine o'clock. I hope everyone's enjoyed that, that run through of what medical physics is, covering certainly the past, what medical physicists have, have contributed um, to what we do day to day, what they do currently, and how they will continue to be an important part of um, doctors navigating the future with AI and radiomics. Hope everybody enjoyed that, and we'll see you on the next episode. Assalamu alaikum.